Thank you all so much. Yeah. We were out on adult music tonight. I think they're upstairs, the youth with Bonnie and um, Heather, and they're practicing. Uh, with Bonnie, but um, tonight we have a, a special, I don't even call him a guest anymore, he's here so much, so uh, we, uh, we, we are very blessed to have Brother Sammy with us tonight, and he's going to come and share what the Lord has laid on his heart, and I just want to remind you, we don't have Wednesday night service, but most of us will probably be here almost all week anyway, so uh, we'll be around, and uh, Looking forward to the fundraiser, but brother, right now we're looking forward to hear what the Lord laid on your heart. Okay, can everybody hear me? Thank you. We don't want to give the devil no place, right? We'll make sure you're loud enough, but not too loud. Soft enough, but not too soft. Amen. I'm going to slide this to the side. Put my eyes on that I might see. It's a good crowd tonight. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I want to thank Brother Stanley, my brother in arm, for allowing me to share his pulpit. Thank you, brother. Um, let me let me tell you just a little bit about me. I was I was uh Raised Methodist. I was sprinkled with Baptist. My uh, one of Mama's sisters, my aunt, married married a Baptist, and I used to love to go with her to church and that. And uh, honestly, the reason they had more fun, so I wanted to go. And I saw. Uh, I saw God working in me at 12 years old. God saved me at Baptist after after a revival. I uh, I didn't accept Him in the church, but I tell you what I what I did do. After that, uh, one of my the, the uncle's nephews went out with me, and God began to deal with me, and He began to move in my spirit, and. Many of you know about the old dirt road. Well, we went out, and like I said, I was raised Methodist, and I sat on that little dirt pile that's on the sides of the road, and I sit there, and I begin to weep, and I, I just begin to cry, and that's when I begin to know that something was going on, and I had a, 
someone beside me that was a little more educated and knew more about God was already saved. And he began to minister to me. Now, he wasn't old either. He was probably 16, 17. And that's, that became my experience. That was my experience of salvation, being saved, brought out. Stayed in church a long time. Got married. Kathy and I got married. And got out of church. Just be honest, like Brother Stanley. Just got out of church for a little season. And, uh, you know, the Lord works out things for us. Sometimes we don't see it. And sometimes we can't recognize it. So we don't know what he's doing. Um, but in 19... 19- 88, she was working at B.C. Moore's in Darlington, and the pastor of the First PH Church in Darlington, his wife, was working there, and he came up, evangelized, he came up, spoke to me while I was picking her up, or there one day, and he spoke to me, and later invited us to church, and I, I was, I was raised in church, I understand church, we walked to church, I probably lived from here to the road out there from Indian Branch. We walked to church, raised up in church, knew all about church. But I knew not to lie. And the pastor said, I hope to see you Sunday at church. And I said, Pastor, might not be this Sunday, but you'll see me. And we, we went. And I didn't understand everything. I was raised in a church where Methodist. You come in, you sit down, the preacher does, they sing, you don't say anything. That's the reverence. I thank God for that. Any Methodists in here? Any Methodists? Anybody want to admit they're Methodists? <laughs> I, I was. And I thank God for that, Pastor. I thank God he, they, they reverence God's house. But in the Baptist, I had a little more freedom when I went with my aunt. And I enjoyed that. And that began to do something in me. Like I said, that's where I came to meet Jesus Christ. And after that, we went to the Pentecostal in 1988. And she had a hard time getting me in church after that. That rest of that year. But then I began to understand a little more, began to enjoy a little more. And then in 1989, I rededicated my life. I was old enough to understand. I was old enough to know a lot better. The Bible says when you're a child, you speak like a child. You talk like a child. You walk like a child. You act like a child. But when you become older, when you become mature, then you know the things of God a little bit better. I'm on milk, so now I'm beginning to eat a little taste of the, of the baby food. So now I'm growing in the Lord. But I... I gripped that pew in front of me, and again, I began to weep. And my testimony to all of that is, Christ didn't, he didn't beat me over the head. He didn't condemn me. He didn't do all those things that some people would say, that's what he is, and he had to do that to me. Well, he didn't do that to me. He came to me with love and open arms. That's how I met him, both times. When I went back, when I rededicated my life that day, I think it was around September of 89. That young man right there knows about the first PH church. You know, I saw those arms. I saw who I was. I saw where I was going. And I saw the one that can help change my life. And as I gripped that, and there they, the pastor, he saw it in that. And that Sunday, if I remember what happened correctly, they came to me, and they loved on me. I didn't make my way to the altar, because I couldn't. I couldn't have seen it. I was crying so much. And they came to me, but I confessed it. I came back to him, to a loving God. Amen? So, for the next, from 89 on, I'm Pentecostal. So, lock the doors, lock the doors. I was converted to Pentecostal, saw things, and that's, that's my belief. I'm not religious, I'm, and, no, and no means 
way, shape, or form as before me, Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostal, anything. I preach Jesus. I love Jesus. I depend on the Holy Spirit to speak and move through me. As I, sh I shared with uh, Brother Stanley, I cannot stand here before you tonight or any time. And I told him that's what I do and what I wouldn't do. I said, Lord, I cannot do this. I answered the call. But I can't. In 1999, I answered the call to the ministry. To what Jesus said, I gave to the church, the apostle, prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. I answered that call as one of his ordained, called men, mandated to preach and teach the gospel in the office of. We all have a mandate to show Christ, to be a Christian, that is to show the love of Christ. And I answered that call, and I've lived that life out ever since, 1999. And it's a mandate that, like Pastor Stanley, that we try to fulfill, and I do that. But God knows, I don't remember, brother, if it was you or if it was Brother Frankie, but I'm, I'll be like a jellyfish. I can't stand here and speak and preach the word, teach the word in any way without him, nor do I want to do it without him. Because it's through him that I can stand here tonight. Amen? Amen. So that's who I am. I didn't come preaching doctrine except for this right here. This is my doctrine right here. Amen. Not the math, not not Methodist, not Baptist, not Pentecostal. No kind of religion. I have a relationship tonight. That's why I stand up here to speak and teach. And I like I like the setting like this. And I hope them boys ain't counting how many times I pull my glasses off. Um, that won't distract me. Amen does not distract me. None of that thing. I'm not distracted by all that. I'm kind of like the monkey who works for peanuts. I'm, I'm work, I work for peanuts tonight. So it doesn't matter. Amen. Just be yourself tonight. And if there's anywhere in this teaching, preaching session tonight, if you have a question that's burning, you can ask it. You won't disturb me. Amen? If you would, I want to go ahead and open in prayer. Find out a little bit about me and who those, and like I've told Pastor Stanley, you need to know them that labor among you. And uh, our hearts have joined together. Uh, he's, he's not only my pastor, but he's my friend. He's my brother. He's my fellow confidant in the preaching and teaching of the word. Amen. But let's open up in prayer. Father, I thank you tonight. Thank you for the mandate. As I said, I'm, I'm here. I came here with the mandate and with the word to deliver your word, to teach your word. And I thank you for that tonight. But not only am I here, but I know that the Holy Spirit's here to speak this word, to preach this word through me and to use me, and I open myself unto you, knowing that with you all things are possible. Now I pray just like the farmer, he tills that ground so the seeds will go into the depths and they will uh, start begin to take root and they'll produce those good fruits for what it's designed to do. So tonight I pray you just speak through me, soften my heart, let my ears be open, and let it be receptive to the word of God. And may all those that are sitting here amongst the hearing of my voice tonight, uh, may their hearts be open and receptive along with their ears and their eyes. as We break open your word, and it's in Jesus' name we pray and believe. Amen. Amen. I'd like for us to, if we could, turn to 2 Timothy. It'd be chapter 3. And verse 16, really going to be talking about verse 16 and 17. We'll see where we go from here. Now, I don't see a clock on the back wall, and I couldn't read it if I 
If I did, so I'm going to have to depend on my wife. So we, I know y'all have a meeting, and I'm not going to take advantage of people's time and things that are ordained by God to take place. So, But we're talking about Scripture tonight, and it goes along somewhat with what pastor's talking about in the morning, the spiritual warfare and preaching on all the Scripture. Read, take these off, I can see it better on the back. But all scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God, and that means a lot of times when, when God's word talks about man, it, it is in the singular. It, it is talking about the gender, the gender man. In a lot of cases, in, it's speaking about that the man of God now, Timothy, Paul is talking to Timothy here, but it also means that the people of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Verse 17. So, the men and women of God, that's what we're talking about as far as what this is given to. In this, Every word in this Bible, in God's Word, and what that means, God's Word, that's just it. It was God breathed. Amen. Every word in here is good for us, and it's given to us. Every word, the whole Bible, and when it talks about the uh, inspiration of the Word of God, it means it's God breathed. God actually breathed His Word. Through the Holy Spirit, he spoke that word, the infallible word of God. He spoke that to us through this word, and sometimes he speaks to us, but he spoke through manuscripts that this Bible was transcribed from. He spoke that to them through his Holy Spirit. There's nothing in this word, I assure you tonight, there's nothing in this word that's fallible. This is the infallible word of God. And what that means simply, like I said, the inspiration of God, when you look it up, Jimmy, it just means it was God breathed. It was God himself that spoke to the men who wrote this Bible. And with the Holy Spirit, he began to put things together. Now, there are other manuscripts um, that were found that are not in this book. Brother Stanley, I'm sure he's aware of that. There's things that were not put, other writings of men. But God has in this word everything we need for life. Everything that we need. As, as he, as our pastor, and as pastors of churches, a lot of times we receive word. Sometimes it's not read. We receive the word. Sometimes we don't open our Bibles and read it like we should. We don't study it like we should. And sometimes we don't understand sometimes what we're reading. That's where a good buddy system, that's where coming to church, that's where asking questions comes into play. But it says, all the scriptures given by the inspiration of God, God breathed through the Holy Spirit and is profitable. And what that means, profitable to gain or to have increase, to have more of. Now, if anybody has a business, you want to make a profit. So it's profitable for that business to make a profit and stay in business. This word is profitable for us for whatever our need might be at a certain time. We can go in here and find out what that need might be. You're having trouble, sickness, disease, infirmity. Maybe it's, maybe it's, maybe it's just meeting the basic need. Maybe it's just our basic need. But the word will give you direction. A lot of times we pray, and some don't. I like to pray for the illumination of the Word. Let God show it. In other words, it, it stands out like big, bold, and bright letters. It's here. Here it is. Here's my Word. It's illuminated. You get the understanding of it. That's what it means when it says it is profitable. It's to gain or to make increase. It's in our lives. He wants us to be men and women of God. Like Brother Stanley was preaching 
about the armor. He wants us to be prepared for those things that come down the road. I don't know what's going to happen when we leave here. I don't know what exactly is going to happen before I walk out that door. But I know the one that I trust tonight. And in him, he is the one that I put all faith, confidence, and hope in. And it's profitable for what? For doctrine. It's for teaching. But not only that, when you begin to look up the word and, and, the, and the New Testament. New Testament's written and transcribed from, from the Greek word. So we begin to look out when Brother Stanley says that, <clears throat> study it out, and I, Jimmy had mentioned that the other, the other week, the other Sunday about studying something and what it means. That's, that's what we're talking about. So when we look up, we look up the doctrine, and I begin to study that. It's a teaching, but not only is the doctrine a teaching, but it's correct, the correct teaching, not not the ones, the teaching of the world, not the teaching of what the world might say, but it's what the correct teaching of the Word of God is. Then we go on from doctrine. It's something that we stand on. This book is the doctrine of God. This is a doctrine. We stand on His Word. We talked about fighting this morning and fighting the good fight. The ammunition, here's your ammunition right here, from front to back, whatever's needed. Whatever kind of gun you need, caliber you need, whatever kind of words you need, that's what we have right here in this book. Amen? And it's good for reproof. Hmm. What that basically means, uh, one word it said that it was a rebuke, but it's a rebuke with love. To reprove something or reprove someone, it's a rebuke. Now that's hard. But you know, we can't make change in our lives until, if we're going down the wrong roads, just like I know a lot of the... Uh, roads washed out and different things just like we're going through life you know there may be a bridge out down the road that God sees that we don't see and we'll continue down that road and a lot of times we don't we don't hear the voice we don't remember the scriptures we didn't get into scripture and what happens we run to a point in our life where the bridge is out we run to a dead end then we get into a situation what do we do so that's sometimes that the I, I think, as we said this morning earlier in the prayer, the pastor preached a good message or a good word. Um, but he's not here, to, not here to tickle my ears, not here to tell me everything I want to hear, but he's here by a mandate of God to preach his gospel and rightly divide it. And he is such a loving man of God that what he teaches and what he preaches to us and what he brings to us by the word it's for our benefit because he loves. It's like a parent. We all know it. If you have children, it's like a parent who never corrects that child. And that child will continue to grow in those things. And not only would he grow, but he will exponentially get out of control. It will just keep getting worse and worse and worse until one day he's in jail or worse. That's, that's what that word's talking about, too. We were proof. Is showing a person where they're wrong, where they're going, but it's also that word will bring us back. That word will turn us around and carry us to where we need to be. It's also for the correction. That basically means for the correction, that means setting something right. Setting it right. Getting things right. Bring it for correction. If you correct someone, now if I said, Brother Jimmy, I believe almost all of this book right here. Almost all of it. But I don't know if everything in here could be true or not. That's what we're talking about. You, you set him down, and you set him straight. Now, brother, we, we can't take... That's why a lot of times Christians, and, and you know, my being one too, we take things out of context. We'll take one scripture, one scripture, and we're like a peg fastened in a sure place. We stand on it. 
Do we not? We've all been, I've been guilty of it. I, di- I didn't think, I, I'll just be honest, I, I didn't think, uh, I didn't really didn't think the woman r- was, had a role of being a pastor until I was, I was spiritually, spiritually I was ignorant of the word. Didn't know. I, I knew there was women in the Bible, so it was prophets and stuff. I, I knew, but not, I, I just didn't, had a little trouble, but I was corrected of that. So what does that mean? The word brought correction to me in that sense. They're great, they're great women in the Bible. But because it, it, wasn't, a, it wasn't that I didn't want to know any different, I didn't know any different. Again, the word had to bring correction in my life on that. I was in spiritual ignorance, and that's not, ignorance is not derogatory in that sense. I didn't know any better until I had someone show me and bring me back to what was right. And the correction also means to restore things back to their proper use and their proper place. Amen? Bring it back to where it belongs. And then it's for the instruction in righteousness. Instruction here means schooling, just like tonight. You're preaching or you're teaching, bringing the word, bringing, bringing mankind back to the spiritual righteousness, the righteousness in which Christ, being Christ-like, following after Christ, patterning our lives after his life. Being more Christ-like in the sense that we want to live right, we want to do right, we want to act right, and we want to talk right. The word will begin to move in us to do all those things in our personal life, in our daily life. It's our word, and by the words, the Bible says we live by them sometimes. We live by that word. It develops us. This word will develop you and develop me. That the man of God, or the women, the woman of God, that man, those that believe on Christ, the man of God, may be perfectly and thoroughly furnished unto all good work. Now, we won't be perfect. I don't want to take it out of context, but we're not perfect. We will be perfect when he comes back for the church or we go to heaven by the grave, whichever way. One day, we will know all things. We will be in a perfect state. We will live in perfect harmony, just like Christ is today. He is perfect. The Bible says there was none perfect, no, not one, except him. Apart from him, there is no perfect. Not by the work, just like it says about salvation. You can't work your way into heaven. You can't buy your way into heaven. The only way into heaven, the Bible says, only through the Son can we go to the Father. And only through Christ we can be made whole and our sins be forgiven. Amen? So when it says in seven, seven, verse 17 that we may be perfect, I, I'm also thinking what they say, we may be, says here that we may be complete, and that's what that also means, being completed, I'm reading from the King James Version, but I always mostly preach out of the New King James, these words are bigger tonight, I didn't know how the lighting would be, but it says that the man of God may be complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work, thoroughly means not being left out, nothing being left out, that we can be equipped for every good work. Amen? Maybe, maybe you don't know how to, we hear it a lot of times, I'm not an evangelist. I, I can't evangelize. I, I can't win people to Christ. Well, our lifestyles, our way of life, is going to do two things. It's going to lead them to Christ, or it's going to be like a bug repellent that we spray on for the mosquitoes, or what they see in us, they don't want no part of. So how are we living our Christian life? Is it bringing? Sometimes we don't have to say a word. Some, i give you an example of, of evangelism and telling people about the Christ that lives inside of us and lives inside of me, lives inside of you. 
when Bilo's, everybody remember where Bilo's used to be in Darlington? If you ever shop Bilo's, it can be any grocery store, but this is what took place with me. God gave me an opportunity one morning or one afternoon. I was in there, and God began to minister to me. It just felt like, you know, I was going to be able to, felt like that someone was going to cross my path that day that I would be able to tell Christ about. But you don't have to have a Holy Spirit inkling or push. That's just supposed to be our daily life, to show Christ. Amen? But I felt like he was going to do something that day. So I'm in there, got to the fruit, and a lady had picked up an apple, and I was by getting some bananas or something right beside her there. And I had such a umpteen that I knew it was her. And I started up a conversation like this. She had that apple, so I reached over and I got an apple. I said, and I can think about the church and heart, so we, I'll tell you a story about that. I grabbed the apple also. I said, you know, there's a story about this apple. I said, it's partly true. But I said there was Adam and Eve in the midst of the garden was a tree. And I said, and there was a fruit on that tree. And I said, a lot of people, including myself, wondering what kind of fruit it was. And I said, it was the fruit of tree of knowledge. I said, but what, what shape, what color? I said, a lot of people. And she said, well, it could have been this apple that they ate. I said, yeah, it could have been. I said, they ate of the fruit of tree of knowledge, good and evil. I said, I don't know if it was this. I said, but I know this. I know him. And I said, I'm a Christian. I said, and, you know, if you're not, I said, in this day and this time, I said, he's, he's, he's a God of love. He's a God that will meet your need. I said, you know, if you don't know him, I said, you know, I'm here to help you and all that. She said, well, it gets me to thinking. I never, I never seen, she didn't make a profession, she didn't ask to go further, but God gave me an apple to use, and we were, we were ministering to, I, I don't call myself a youth pastor, I just said, I, meant, I pastored the youth at a church in Hartsville, for, <laughs> that was a tough job, I didn't know, I didn't know, I was already pa- preaching to adults, and we had Sunday school, like we were talking about in prayer today, we had Sunday school with small six to 18, and God gave me a mandate, teach these kids. Okay, Lord. Well, we were on that subject. I had some curriculum, and uh, I used one little page of it, and it was talking about that tree of knowledge and things and how to reach. Now, we had a, Kathy and I, co-pastored them together. I had a that's, a, that's a hard job. That's a hard job. You got six to, from six to 17 or 18 year old, and you're trying to minister to all of them at the same time. But we were talking about the fruit from that tree, trying to grab, and the Lord, and all of a sudden, the little fella, I was 10 or so, 12, he said, yep, yeah, I got a, I got a question. I said, okay, what's your question? He said, I know what kind of fruit it was. I said, you do? He said, yep, I know it. I can answer that question. I didn't even ask that, but he, he was on that same thing. I didn't ask him what kind of fruit, but I was talking about the fruit, but he wanted to let me know that he's been taught about that fruit that was on the tree of knowledge. I said, well, tell me, tell me about that. I said, son, tell me that, that fruit that was on there. Tell me about it. Well, my grandmama told me exactly what it was. I said, what was it? It was an apple. That's what they ate. It was an apple. I said, well, that's good. I said, but it doesn't say what kind of fruit. It just says don't eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Don't eat that fruit off of it. He said, no, my grandmama said, and I know what my grandmama said, and it was an apple. I said, well, at least you were listening to grandmama. But I said, you can learn something today. He said, what's that? I said, you go back and tell grandmama that I've got the Bible right here and I'm under the scripture. 
And it doesn't say what kind of fruit it was, but it said don't eat of the fruit of, but kind of fruit it didn't say. Nope, my grandmama said it was an apple. And if grandmama said it, it's the truth. But that's why, what's the moral of that story? Tell the truth. And uh, I had to endure a teaching about how much I didn't know about that fruit from grandmama. But I did get grandmama convinced. I got grandmama convinced. How did I convince grandma? You know, sometimes we just have to show them where things are in this world. Amen? We just have to, we have to tell them, but sometimes there are a lot of people from Missouri to show me state. We just have to, we just have to show them. Let me say it this way. Was it, was it a point that I, I was being right about something, that I had to be right? No, it wasn't. It was a point about right teaching, Pastor. Right teaching. You, you've dealt with kids, you know. Would it have made a real big difference? Well, to me it did. To me that's a doctrine, that's a teaching. And if that, he was on the right path, I gave him credit. I gave Grandmama the credit. And when I showed her that, I said, Miss So and so, you know, he was very adamant. I said, and I can, I praised her for the fact that she took her grandson. I think I might have said son, but it was the grandson. The grandson. Her mother was there too, but he, she came, both of them came back there, you know. But the point of it is, is, that I wanted to make sure that the mandate that was on my life to rightly divide and to rightly teach it, it, it may have not made that much of a difference, but like you said this morning, Pastor, this was a child, and he's very influenced by what he's taught, what he sees, what he's heard, and my way of what I felt like I needed to do was to make sure that he had the right information. He had the right doctrine. Was he going to hell for that? No, he was not. But the point of it was that I had to make sure. And that's why I want to make sure I taught the child on up. And that's why I want to make sure I give the right doctrine. I rightly divide the word. It wasn't for that. And she did thank me. She said, yeah, I've just, I was told that. That's, that's another moral of the story. I was told, I was told that that's what it was. Her mother told her, it's a teaching, but it's the right teaching. Amen? That's, that's where I was coming from. I want to make sure I don't run over. Huh? Okay, I want to make sure I don't run into the other meeting. I don't want to take advantage. Are there, are there any? I'm, I'm like this. I said it's open. That's just the way I mean. A lot, of, a lot of times I preach illustrated sermons. I use things. But I want to, so thus far, is there any questions? Anything? Concerns? Complaints? Brother Stanley will take in the back corner back here after it's over with. He's going to take them. Any questions, I'll take. Anything thus far? Amen. 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 That's good. What time is it? Be a crack. Quarter till. Okay. All right. Jonathan, if you would, if you turn, if you have your Bibles, to Hebrews chapter 4. I just want to touch on chapter 4, verse 12. One, one verse of Scripture. And you can, you can read... Um, you can read chapter 4, the whole 1 through 10 if you want to, 1 through 11. When you get home, look about it. I'll tell you what, it's a, kind of a summary of what they're talking about here. This is uh, from 1 through 10, 1 through 11. It's talking about Israel and talking about Israel not making it into Canaan uh, and having a rest. Um, what they're talking about there. There's two, there's two points here to so those verse 1 through 10 that kind of ties with, with what we're talking about tonight. It's talking about a, about a rest over there. I don't want to get 
confused about that, but there's two points. There's a, there's a heavenly rest, and there's a rest for Christians today, and that is a life that goes along with what I'm saying. You, you're fully, the rest is you're fully surrendered in Christ, in your life, where you're at. That's one of the rests that it talks about before then, and I would encourage you to, to read that. Our rest today is um, fully surrendering to the, to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and to Him. But when we go down and pick up the tie back into Second uh, Timothy, we talk about verse 12 for the Word. And let me read, I got the King James, but let's read so we're on the same page. For the Word of God is living and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword. And it's piercing even to the division of the soul and the spirit and of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There again, we talk about the word. It's living, what I was just saying. Christ living in us. Who was Christ? John talks about that, first chapter. In the beginning was God, and, and the Word was it, Word, and in the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we talk about Christ. I want I want to say another part talking about the Word, um, being Christ was the Word. This right here is the Word of Christ, not only the Word of God, but it's the Word of Christ. Christ was the Word in the beginning. It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Can't separate them. For the word of God is quick and it's powerful. Just, just to make one quick two points to that um, so I don't run out of time into someone else's. Those things as quick, powerful, and as sharper than a two-edged sword and as piercing even to the dividing asunder the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. What does that do and what does it say in the two things? It reveals whether or not our life or not is lived in, in Christ and how we live that life. And then it's how Christ is able to bring us into fellowship. That's what that's talking about. It's talking about those two things and the way we live our life. And then it's talking about a correction as to whether we are living a Christ-like life. It, it, it helps divide, as it says, it divides our life that's before him. It's kind of like, okay, this is good. This you don't need. This is, you, this is what you need to use for this. This you don't need. It divides, even our thoughts. God knows even our thoughts. And that word will divide those things that are in our life, our lives are full of clutter today, aren't they, folks? We got so many things going on, so many, so many things buying for our attention, um, Facebook, whatever you want to say, social media, all those things, all those things are competing for the home life, comes into home and we're, we're, we're separated. Uh, unfortunately so much well, with us it's just me and Kathy that, but people that have families they're going here, they're going there all these things and, and the word if we don't have the word in us we don't let the word convict us we don't let the word show us, bring us we don't have the word to illuminate those things that we need in our life, we're going to continue to walk down that path of complacency, that path of clutter that steals away time that we need for Him. Amen? Amen? And there's one thing, I didn't need the water. There's one thing that we, that I usually like to do also when I'm finished, I'm, I'm not like the old pastors, I don't, I don't regurgitate and we, get the loudest amen, I go back to that point. I'm not that kind of, I just, I'm, 
when I'm when God's through, I'm through. But there's one thing I, I do at the end of ever, and I always have since the call from the first time I preached and taught, is I give Him the credit. Again, I could not be here, stand here, without His will, without the Holy Spirit, and I, all the credit I give to Him. A little, just a little nugget before we got married. This is kind of person I was. I did not even think, and they didn't think I was going to even be able to answer the marriage vows. Will you? Won't you? You did. You didn't. I just didn't talk. I just didn't stand in front of people. I just didn't. I saw fear in it. But when that day came that I answered, he didn't change my demeanor. He didn't change Brother Stanley's demeanor. Didn't do all those things, but he came in with a power and came in with authority and the boldness that he gives us, and we're not afraid. Now, if I had to stand here without him, sure, I wouldn't have showed up. I'd have had to stand Brother Stanley up. He'd have been looking at the door of where I was, but I came with him within me because I know greater is he that's in me than whoever's in that world, and I'm not in that world. So I thank him publicly tonight for what he did with me, in me, and through me. It's by him. Amen? Brother Stanley? Anybody want to hear it, Terry? I just heard him talk about knowing you in 19, I think he said 69 or something. You was running around. I don't know. Um, but I do want to uh, thank everybody for being here tonight. I thank my brother Sammy and uh, his prayers have meant the world to me um, over the last few Sundays. And uh, and so um, I thank you to everyone who is willing to share on, on Sunday nights. And uh, next, next Sunday night I'll have um, the message and we'll start a new study and we'll sprinkle some people in uh, amongst my messages just like uh, on Sunday mornings but we'll continue next Sunday with spiritual warfare and we'll get into the armor uh, the defensive armor and then we'll finish up with our offensive armor and so um, as we move forward don't forget this week we do not have Wednesday night service and uh, I do want to thank b before uh, I move on to closing us out I do want to thank brother Sam as he he shared, I was taking notes, and um, one of the things that uh, the Lord laid on my heart, you know, it's so important that we we not only teach, you know, anytime we talk about teaching the word, we always think of kids, and we think of youth, but we have to be sure that we have new Christians oftentimes that come into the churches, uh, and even old you know, people who accept Christ later in life, maybe they've been in church their whole life, but they still don't have that foundation. And the foundation has to start with the Word of God. And so we want to make sure that when we are bringing people into the church and we get them saved, we want them saved. A amen? We want them to go to heaven. We want them to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, but we also want to make sure that they um, learn the Word of God because the word of God helps them to provide direction in their life. And it helps them to correct whatever it is that they may be doing wrong. And it, it also is a guide for their life in general. So when they're having problems, because we know they're going to have problems. Uh, everybody here who has accepted Christ knows that that's not the end. You know, you, when, when you become a Christian... It's not a magic wand. All your problems are over. If that was the case, everybody would be a Christian, right? It wouldn't be too hard to, to get out there and get convinced people to become a child of God. But oftentimes it gets a little bit tougher because um, we're, we're, we're challenged and we're put to the test. And in order for us to um, do those things, we need to understand the Word of God and we need to study the Word of God. So thank you all for being here if you're staying for the fundraiser meeting, please do that. If you're going to be a part of it, we need you. We need you. We need you. Okay? We really need you. Did I say we need you? All right. Well, I'm, 
Jonathan, we meeting in here, or we're going to try to go in there? I know Jonathan wants to try to set up, but it looks like we're going to have a big crowd, Jonathan, so we may have to meet in here, okay? Um, but let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for another night. Lord, we do thank you for your word. I thank you for Brother Sammy and his testimony. I thank you for the fact, Lord, that we can open up your word, we can rightly divide it, and we can, we can learn and teach one another. Lord, we can help to guide one another because every once in a while, one of us may run into ditch. But it's a blessing to have a brother and sister to help us get out of it, to help lead us and help guide us and help direct us. Lord, be with us as we go our separate ways. Help us to be bold in our, in our walk with you. Lord, help us to be bold in sharing the gospel with everyone that we come in contact with. This week, as we have our fundraiser, Lord, I pray for each and every individual to be a part of that. Lord, I pray for the health. Lord, that we would be healthy. Lord, that we would be willing to step up and we would be willing to be a part of the fundraiser that when we get uh, a moment, as we talked about in the prayer closet, if someone gets upset at another person, that we would just walk away, say a prayer, come back, smile, and continue to work because it's not about that person, it's not about you, but it's about Jesus. So be with us as we go into our meeting, Lord. Help us to be good stewards of what you have blessed us with so richly. We love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.